Welcome to the west coast of Ireland, the west coast of Donegal. Welcome to the spot where the wild Atlantic Ocean meets the island of Ireland. This little strip of coastline that is controlled by the tide, the tide coming in twice a day and going out twice a day. Welcome to perhaps the toughest place in all of Ireland to live. Over the next few minutes, we're going to explore two different types of habitat that are along our coastlines. We're going to explore the rocky shore that you can see around us here, and we're going to explore sand dunes. Now, both the rocky shore and the sand dunes are our front line of defence. Our front line of defence against the huge amount of energy that is stored in that Atlantic Ocean, the massive storms that come every year, plus all of the constant, constant pushing of the waves, and of course, the huge amount of rain that pours in over the coast. These little habitats, they protect all of our farmland, all of our communities, everything we know and cherish so much that is just inland from here. Along the rocky shore, scientists have classified various different zones. And the first zone is just above the high tide mark. And we call that the splash zone, the zone that gets splashed continuously by waves every time that high tide comes in, which of course is a little over six hours each day. So two cycles of high tides throw salty water onto these rocks and onto these particularly tough plants that are here. You can see a variety of lichens and lichens, those amazing ancient, ancient plants, that combination of algae, which seaweed is, and fungus. Those combine together to make lichens. We have white lichens, orange lichens, and we also have this black tar lichen. Now this rock isn't black, but it looks like it is from here. And this little strip of black tar lichen will only grow about a meter or so above the splash zone and a meter or so below. But it's on all rocky shores all around the coast of Ireland. So immediately from a distance, you can tell where the high tide mark is if you look to the rocks, as long as the waters are clean you'll see this black tar lichen growing all the way around. Another indicator of the splash zone is this really tough, beautiful sea pink. Now at this stage, it's mostly turned. You can still see some of the flower heads around us, but it's mostly gone to seed for next year's generation. But sea pink will grow again and again, very, very slowly. It's able to tolerate the really salty conditions. It's able to tolerate the massive storms, the waves that will break right over these rocks a little bit later on in the year. And it's able to hang on, cling on, and wait until the springtime when there's enough light availability for it to be able to start growing, photosynthesizing well. Below the splash zone here, where the black tar lichen starts to disappear, we start to have our very first sea creatures our very first creatures that are really of the sea, but are able to tolerate being exposed for so long. And that, of course, is the little barnacles, the very tough, very strong little barnacles. And each little barnacle has a tiny trap door, which it closes tight, waiting for the tide to come back in. And when that tide comes back in, it extends its little tiny, tiny tentacles. And those hair-like tentacles will try and grab anything that's in the sea. Plankton is what they're looking for, Plankton, of course, just being tiny, microscopic little sea creatures. The zooplankton, which are the little tiny animals, and the phytoplankton are the tiny plants, the plants that give us half of the oxygen that we breathe throughout our lives through the process of photosynthesizing. So the little barnacles, they help tidy up the sea. Anything that comes in from us, any microplastics, any sewage, any oil spillages, any extra nutrition that's coming in, they're pulling everything in and they're taking it into their tiny little bodies. Once we start moving lower down then into the middle tidal zone, we start to see the limpets. The first small limpets here, and then these bigger characters. And limpets, like all of these different sea creatures that live in this zone that is half land when it's exposed to the rain, exposed to the air, exposed to the snow and the ice in the winter time, and exposed to the heat in the summer. They all are trying to fight desiccation. And desiccation or drying out seems like a strange problem to have here in Ireland where it rains so much, especially on the west coast. But the constant breeze, the constant wind is what gives them the danger of drying out. So they all have different little ways of locking onto the rocks really tight and keeping a little bit of moisture inside, waiting for that tide to come back in before they can start moving about. 
So once we leave the upper zone with its barnacles, and we go down into the middle tidal zone, the zone that is covered over about half of the time. We have our limpets, but we also have our winkles. And there are many different types of winkle. This little guy stuck to the rock. There are some beautiful coloured ones in the slightly higher bit. The lower down you go, we start to see our edible winkles. And of course, both limpets and winkles would have been such an important food source for the communities in these areas in years gone by. And to this day, people still eat these little winkles. These winkles that are eating away on the algae and sometimes on the seaweeds that are all around us. And then as we move deeper into the lower tidal zone, where we start to get the deeper colored, the richer colored seaweeds, we have these very beautiful top shells. Now we know they're a top shell because when we put them on our hands, the little point is on top. And these top shells have a gorgeous color, but inside they have this iridescence in their shell. Very beautiful little characters. And they tend to stay in that lower zone. All of those shells watching out for their enemy, the whelk. And the whelk, which is such a tough little character, many different species, with this long groove, they have a sharp, sharp tongue that is able to graze and gouge away at the shells and break a hole in the shells and eat up the little character in the inside. The whelks and the starfish are the biggest mobile enemies of a lot of these shellfish that are clinging onto the rocks in this tough, tough place to live. Seaweeds are, of course, another very common feature of the rocky shore. And seaweeds can help tell us what zone we're in, much like the shellfish. The green algae or seaweeds will be in the upper zone, able to photosynthesize because there's enough light available to them, much like a lot of the land plants. Whereas then, when you go deeper down into the ocean, once the, the tide is in, the seaweeds turn brown and then they even turn reds and sometimes purples, very beautiful colors, but colors that will allow them access the light that is able to penetrate so deep into the ocean at the highest of tides. And of course, seaweeds are the original plants of the world. They're the very first plants to start pulling carbon dioxide down out of the atmosphere, capturing that carbon for their own growth and releasing the oxygen. So they are hugely important to us. And it's the seaweeds and the, the planktons, the planktons that are plants, the microscopic plants in the ocean, that give us half of the oxygen that we will breathe throughout our lives. Seaweeds have an amazing ability to be able to endure the storms and the constant wave pressure. They're able to glue themselves to the rocks, but also they release a gel, and that gel helps them slip and slide across each other so they don't wear each other down. The fronds don't wear each other down as that constant wave action pulls them back and forth and back and forth. And of course then they provide a nursery for all of the young fish and for the small crabs and for a lot of the shellfish that are here. And it's hard to mention any of Ireland's biodiversity, any of the world's biodiversity, without touching on climate change and the challenges that brings. And even for our rocky shore and our sea creatures, climate change is a huge issue. By heating up the ocean, we're changing the ocean temperatures. And an awful lot of these plants and animals have evolved over a vast amount of time to have the cool, cool waters that we have. So as those ocean temperatures spike, as we break the records, records tumbling this year for ocean temperatures, that puts them under stress. And another threat that climate change brings is all that extra carbon dioxide that you and I pump up into the atmosphere with all of our actions. The chemical reactions of that carbon dioxide and the water turns it into carbonic acid, a mild acid, and that acid works away on the shellfish and depletes their only line of defense against the starfish against the whelks and against all the other characters that would try and eat them. Away from the rocky shore, the other line of defense that we have, that all of our terrestrial habitats have, is the sand dunes. And the sand dunes, they start off with just a couple of very, very tough plants. Plants like this marram grass here. And the marram grass has the ability to be able to suck up water with its extensive root system and to push out the salt that's in that salty water, that brackish water that often can be around these edge of land and sea areas. And it's able to push out that salt, but with all of that extensive root system, it's grabbing and it's holding onto the sand, the sand that is constantly shifting with the wind and with the waves. And by holding onto that sand, it starts to build a little dune, just like this embryonic dune that you can see here. And this embryonic dune raises up for a meter, maybe two, 
and then dips down a little bit and behind that is another dune. In the summertime it has the ability to put out little suckers or little shoots from its root system and by doing that grabs more sand and allows the dune to grow. But then in the winter time it gets bashed back, pulled back by the waves that are clawing away at it all the time. And of course our storms with climate change are becoming more vigorous and harder to predict. Marum grass forms that first line of defence, builds those very first dunes for the rest of the dune systems behind and then of course all of our own business. So once these tough grasses like the marum grass and those other plants that are able to at very first hold on to the sand, once they get established and once they form those embryonic dunes, those very first dunes, the dunes themselves can turn into huge mountains of sand like we have amongst us here. Those vast mountains of sand are all held together by these special kind of plants that are able to spread out so many roots, grasping the sand and desperately reaching down for any kind of water that they can access. We don't think of these huge dunes as mobile, but they are. These huge mountains of sand, they do tend to move around. You can see the erosion that's happening around me here. These dunes act as protection. They're our front line against the Atlantic Ocean storms, the huge waves, the ferocious energy that is coming across the Atlantic. They're protecting the farmland, they're protecting the football pitches, the communities, and of course, the bog and the mountains that are further back inland. The fact that these dunes aren't overgrazed is perfectly illustrated by this plant here, one of the original trees that came into Ireland. This is creeping juniper. And juniper is a sign that these dunes have been here a very long time. And of course, the deep, deep roots of juniper are binding all of this sand together, helping hold this dune. But you can see the erosion still going on underneath it. Juniper, when you crush the leaves, gives off a lovely scent. And you can see the new berries just starting to come. It takes two years for them to fully ripen. And we have some beautiful little purple berries inside. And of course, they're feeding the birds, the birds that breed here, and the birds that pass through this area in autumn time on migrations heading further south. This little patch here just illustrates the importance of a well-managed dune system for biodiversity, for all sorts of different forms of life. Just have a look at the amount of different types of plants here that are all around us. You have the vetches that have gone to seed, and the seeds starting to fall off. You have the beautiful grass of Parnassus that comes out late in the year. And in some parts of the world, when the grass of Parnassus came out, that was the key to them, the signal to them from nature that it was time to start the harvest. It was that time of year when this character appeared. You have the beautiful eye bright, so small, so delicate, but used in the past as a tonic for the eyes and to treat various different ailments. And then you have what's already gone to seed, the yellow rattle. And the yellow rattle is an amazing little plant. It rattles the seed heads when you touch them, but yellow rattle spreads its roots around the grasses all around here and some of the other plants, and it takes nutrition from them. It depletes the other plants of nutrition. So as a result, it competes with the grasses that are very tough, which allows space for all of these different types of wildflowers to grow, which of course gives food for the various different insects and then the birds and further up the food chain. In this part of the dune system, you can see where it's been eroded out. All of this area here is called a dune slack. And a dune slack is effectively a type of disappearing lake. As the water table rises in the winter with all of our rain, this area will become very wet, but it stays damp all year round. And you can see that by the shape of the plants. You can see that by the type of tall rushes that are growing there, by the lovely round pennyworth that we have here, all of which love to be really wet most of the time. And there's even water mint in here, those lovely bright purple flowers. In fact, when you walk through this area, you can smell the mint, the aroma coming up. Insects play such a huge role in this type of habitat, well, in so many types of habitat, and none less so than the little meadow brown butterfly, one of our most common butterflies. And when its wings closed, it's a master of disguise. And butterflies, of course, we can tell they're separate from moths as they rest with their wings up on the underside of the wings so well camouflaged, but when they open them up, those beautiful colors to display. And the meadow brown helps pollinate so many of the different wildflowers around here. The 
dunes around us now have changed. You can see the shape of them have changed. This big, flat, sandy plain behind us is called Maher Habitat, or Maher Sand Dunes. And Maher in Irish just means flat, sandy dune, or flat, sandy plain. And these areas, they have been used traditionally for a huge amount of time, hundreds and hundreds of years. Farmers will bring their cattle here in the winter, even though it's so close to the coast, because this area will drain so well, being so sandy. And then the hills behind us, they will bring their cattle back up there in the summertime up to forage on the grasses and the shrubs that they'll find up in the hills. And by bringing their cattle on here, they eat up an awful lot of the tough grasses that we see around us. And that gives an opportunity for the various different wildflowers and other plants to be able to grow and able to thrive. And that of course helps the vast amount of insect life, which in turn feeds some of the birds that we can hear around us. You get beautiful little birds like twite that will nest in the little rocky outcrops. You'll get birds like lapwing, like oyster catchers, and skylarks that will nest in amongst the grasses, sheltered here by these tall grasses. And those tall grasses are enabled by the landowners, by the practice of farming, by the way that people manage this type of land. Maher habitat is unique to the west coast of Ireland and the west coast of Scotland. This type of sandy plain doesn't exist anywhere else. We have big tall sand dunes over to this side of me and of course on the other side of that is the Atlantic Ocean. And with the wind that is blowing all the time, it blows the sand and it blows tiny, tiny little shells. And those shells that are falling down with the sand in the storms, in the winter storms, falling down on this big flat plain, that helps to fertilize the area that's here, make it very calcium rich, which helps to have this huge diversity of wildflowers. Such beautiful colors, such beautiful scents that you get here in the summertime. At the back of the Maher habitat then, it turns into a wetland and then eventually turns into bog, the blanket bog that covers so much of Donegal and the west of Ireland. So that special little strip all the way around our wonderful island of Ireland, that coastal zone, the tidal zones, that area between the land and the sea is well worth exploring. But it's amazing range of habitats, be it the different types of rocky shores, be it all the different types of dunes, it provides so much life, it shelters so much life. So many birds rely on that throughout both summer for breeding and winter for shelter. Of course, we rely on it ourselves for food. We rely on the whole area for helping us store carbon in our fight against climate change. And it's a beautiful, peaceful place to be. Go and explore. Be careful. Watch out for that never-ending pull of the moon, the tides. Check your tide times. But explore down the rocky shore. Explore along the high tide marks. Explore along the splash zones. Have a look, have a feel of some of the amazing creatures and plants that live there. It's ours, it's ours to enjoy and ours to protect.